well, here we are. Our caravan is lumbering on, we might say, or our Lenten journey is progressing. It's a journey with Jesus to Jerusalem. It's a journey with the people of Israel out of Egypt through the desert to the promised land. It's a six-week pilgrimage up the Lenten mountain to Easter. And we, we make it with our fellow Christians, with the church spread throughout the world, together with Francis our Pope, as we say in the Eucharistic prayer. A mixed multitude, uh, says Exodus, came out of Egypt. Uh, and I suppose that's not a bad description of ourselves. Uh, so it is. Some people are looking forward to their baptism uh, at Easter, others to confirmation, others are on their way to full communion with the church, others on their way back to her through the sacrament of reconciliation. All of us are striving in our way to enter or re-enter or enter more deeply what St. Paul calls the state of grace that place we enter by faith and through Jesus, he says, where we are judged righteous and at peace with God and can look forward to God's glory, where we are truly the sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. Well, there we are. But on this journey, uh, these next three Sundays, we are offered three unlikely travel companions. Next week, it is the man born blind. The week after, it is Lazarus, dead and decomposing. And this week, it's the Samaritan woman. Well, uh, she is an unusual one, uh, feisty, uh, fond of argument, uh, with a, a checkered past and present, she's on man number six. And in many ways, the dice are stacked against her. Uh, she's a woman to begin with, so in her world, a second-class citizen. And fr from what we learn, uh, she had men problems. And why does she go to the well by herself at the hottest time of the day when everyone else will be resting indoors? Was she something of an outcast? Well, from a Jewish point of view, as a Samaritan, she certainly was. And that would have struck deep in her soul, and not for the good. Because there she is, she's a member of a minority which has been cherishing a long resentment towards their Jewish neighbors, a heretic in their mind, worshiping stubbornly at the wrong place, Mount Gerizim instead of Jerusalem, her mind narrowed and her heart hardened by centuries of theological controversy and outbreaks of violence. What? You are a Jew and you ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink. Uh, behind that, she's really saying, are you out to cause trouble? Uh, if she was a man, she'd have probably said, are you trying to pick a fight? Uh, well, you see the kind of personal profile that emerges here. Not very promising, really. But Jesus, tired by his journey, sits down by the well, Jacob's well. Uh, it's still there, I believe. And immediately we're thrown back to Genesis and the memory of those wells where Abraham's servant found Rebekah as a future wife for Isaac and Jacob met Rachel and later where Moses met his wife. And immediately there's some kind of marriage on the horizon. This is why St. Augustine calls her a figure a symbol of the church called from the Gentiles, called out of her mess to be washed and anointed and turned into a beautiful bride. 
And what does Jesus see in her? Her thirst, her many-layered thirst, an aching near eastern thirst for water, another thirst as well for love, for real relationship, the thirst she had tr tried to quench with her many men. Jesus shows himself as the true Jacob's well, the one who opens the aquifer of the Holy Spirit. The water that I shall give will turn into a spring, welling up to eternal life. And in the presence of this unconventional Jew, who shouldn't have been talking to her, she feels more and more known. Her desires are known. Her whole steamy life story is already read by him, and thus already in process of being sorted. Perhaps she feels she was being given back to herself, body and soul. It must have been quite intense. So uh, she starts a red herring. Well, she has to di distract herself by beginning an argument about temple worship. But for Jesus, the great evangelist, this is just another occasion to take her on. The hour will come. In fact, is here already, he says, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. After the real water, with which he begins, comes the real worship. After the infusion of the Holy Spirit, comes worship of the Father in spirit and truth. She is being led out of her cultural and ethnic confines into a good and broad land, into a new kind of freedom, a larger space where her whole life can become one act of praise. What is happening in her, being shown to her, is what Paul, St. Paul would later advocate. Brothers and sisters, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. No wonder St. Augustine again calls her the form of the church, because this is what is coming to birth in her. He has disclosed the Holy Spirit to her um, in the imagery of water, and then the Father. We could say, too, I mean, looking ahead into our experience, baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. And all the while, the man before her grows and grows in her mind. He begins as a Jew, but then becomes a prophet, and the prophet, the Messiah. I, who am speaking to you, said Jesus, I am he. So she's on the brink of the Trinity, we might say. She's traveled so far. Then, okay, as the story goes, the disciples come back from the town. They've done their shopping. She gets up. She leaves her, her jar, her water, by the well. Worth noting that. She forgets about that. And back she goes into town, thirsting to tell. Like Mary Magdalene on Easter morning, the evangelized one is now an evangelist herself, a missionary disciple, as we say. This man knows me. Is he it, do you think? And her fellow townsfolk catch the flame from her and go to Jesus in their turn. We have heard him ourselves, they say at the end, and we know that he really is the savior of the world. Now, it's a wonderful passage, this, this John chapter 4. And what a journey, hers and ours, because actually the whole of our Lent and Easter is traversed by this woman. Through the whole process of Christian initiation, she goes, purified, scrutinized, her demons driven out, enlightened, transformed through the whole process of, of 
or through the process of the whole Christian life, really. That what, that's what she goes through in this short time. And see, too, how at the end she, in a sense, disappears because the citizens say, well, Jesus stays there for two days, and they say, we no longer believe because of what you told us. We have heard him ourselves. So she's really completed her work. She's led them not to herself, but to Christ. Like John the Baptist, she's happy to decrease, for Jesus to increase. So she is a true evangelist. And in another sense, of course, she doesn't disappear at all. She lives in the gospel. Here she is before us today, as it were. And uh, as a historical thing, it's interesting because we know the early Christian mission was especially successful after Jesus' ascension and Pentecost and whatnot. It was particularly successful in Samaria, that the Samaritans responded to the gospel. And this woman surely would have been remembered as the first evangelist. She'd have been, as it were, the spiritual mother of this Christian community in the town of Sychar. And what was the issue of it all? Uh, that meeting by the well, on this journey that she makes. Well, tradition has given her a name. She's anonymous in the gospel, but she's been given a name, Photina, which means the luminous one, the one who is full of light. Uh, she even has a feast day. The one who is full of light and gives light. Well, that's our vocation. Recognize yourself in her, says St. Augustine. We can think Easter Vigil, think Paschal Candle, think Lumen Christi, the light of Christ. That's our vocation. So, if we really meet Christ, if we really make this journey of initiation, this Lent, this Easter, this is what happens. And we can say, Saint Fotina, pray for us.